Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This evening, we turn to a very important and very central concept in the objectivist ethics, namely the virtue of justice. This is the one virtue in the objectivist ethics which specifically is a social virtue, by which I mean the one virtue that specifically pertains to men's relationship with one another. Justice is the virtue that the majority of men pay lip service to, but only a rare minority practice. Why? Because justice pertains to one's judgment, not of nature, but of men. Justice is incompatible with the conventional ethics of altruism. It is incompatible with the creed of self-sacrifice. And by the same token, it is the crucial and, as I say, the only specifically social virtue of the objectivist morality. Objectivism holds, as you of course know, that justice and not sacrifice should be the ruling principle in human relationships. Justice, to quote Galt, is, quote, the recognition of the fact that you must judge all men as conscientiously as you judge inanimate objects with the same respect for truth, with the same incorruptible vision, by as pure and as rational a process of identification. That every man must be judged for what he is and treated accordingly. That just as you do not pay a higher price for a rusty chunk of scrap than for a piece of shining metal, so you do not value a rotter above a hero." Close quote. The immediate protest of the mystic altruist contingent would be, oh no, how cruel and materialistic to judge men as one judges inanimate objects. Well, let's understand the full and exact meaning of such a protest. Since presumably we judge inanimate objects rationally and objectively, the only alternative is to judge men irrationally and non-objectively, to ignore what they are, to disregard their character, in a word, to judge them unjustly. The mystic altruist definition of justice, as opposed to Galt's, would read something like the following. You must not judge men as conscientiously as you judge inanimate objects. Truth is not the only consideration. Higher things may be permitted to cloud your vision. You must not judge men by a pure or a rational process of identification. No man must be judged for what he is. Your treatment of him must bear no relation to his character. You must not value a hero above a rotter. It will hurt the rotter's feelings. To judge men as one judges inanimate objects does not mean to judge them as if they were inanimate objects. It means to judge them by the same epistemology, by the same rules of reason and logic. And that is what the mystic altruists dread. And while they prattle that reason is materialistic and mercy is superior to justice, what their theories mean, in fact, in reality, is that inanimate objects deserve the full focus of man's consciousness, but human beings do not. That inanimate objects deserve the effort of man's rational awareness, of logic, of thought, but human beings do not. That inanimate objects are worthy of justice, but human beings are not. No, of course, this is not what the mystic altruists say, but this is what they practice as proof 
look at mankind's progress in the realm of the material sciences, where reason is the standard for judging inanimate objects, then look at mankind's brutality, terror, and despair in the moral realm of human relationships from which reason and justice have been banned. The killer tenet in this issue is the slogan that mercy is superior to justice. Like self-sacrifice, it is a precept that has been smuggled into men's minds by degrees, through the back door, by means of sloppy definitions, woozy generalities, evasions, and emotional package dealing. Just as most people believe that self-sacrifice means nothing more than some vague sort of kindness, like giving dimes to beggars or contributing to charity drives, and do not realize by what steps they are being pushed into a sacrificial furnace, so most people believe that mercy means nothing more than some vague sort of forgiveness toward petty and repentant offenders. But this is not what mercy means. Even among its advocates, few care to admit to themselves or to others what it actually does mean. The example of mercy which its advocates usually offer is as follows. A judge has the power to sentence a young first offender to serve a jail term of from two to ten years, but he considers mitigating circumstances and gives him the shorter rather than the longer term. Most people accept this as an example of mercy, but this is not an act of mercy, it is an act of justice. If there are circumstances mitigating the boy's guilt, it would be unjust to impose on him a punishment heavier than he deserves. It is precisely in order to weigh mitigating circumstances that judges are given latitude in the choice of punishment. A judge who, in this same case, would impose a 10-year sentence, ignoring the evidence in favor of the boy, would not be unmerciful, but unjust. Justice is not arbitrary. It is not a favor. It is not arbitrary kindness nor arbitrary severity. Justice consists of pronouncing judgment in accordance with all the relevant facts, in accordance with reality. Mercy, on the other hand, is arbitrary. Mercy is a favor. It consists of granting an unearned and undeserved kindness, a kindness contrary to facts and to reality. Mercy consists of kindness superseding reality. If a so-called merciful judge gave the lightest sentence in his power to a hardened criminal in defiance of all the evidence proving that the man was a monster, that would be mercy. And if a year later a merciful parole board set the criminal free, that would be mercy. And if a month later the criminal murdered three people while holding up a store and robbing the cash register of $6.75, that would be the result of mercy. Well, today's law courts and newspapers are full of such instances of mercy. If an employer forgives an employee for an accidental error, the first in six months of efficient and conscientious service, that is not mercy but justice. If an employer keeps forgiving the constant errors of an incompetent employee who does not propose to focus on his work, that is mercy. If you do not know how to judge the character of a person because the facts available to you are insufficient and the evidence of his flaws is inconclusive, you must give him the benefit of the doubt, not on the ground of mercy, but on the ground of justice, because to let off the guilty is less disastrous than to condemn the innocent because virtues are more important than flaws. 
because justice demands that a man be considered innocent until proved guilty. And this principle applies in law courts as well as in your personal relationships with people. Except that in personal relationships, when you give the benefit of the doubt, you do not dismiss the case. You wait for further evidence to prove the good or bad character of the person before you pass a moral judgment.